You also studied national security at Georgetown's famed School of Foreign Services, and that's one of three majors. You did a triple major. Talk a little bit about what it's like to study national security. And I guess for someone like myself, who I kind of think I vaguely know what national security is, how you think about what national security actually is. So, you know, often when I think about studying national security, we think about focusing on their functional areas. So are you trying to understand how intelligence works? Are you trying to understand how to, you know, actually employ military forces? Are you thinking about how unconventional or nuclear biological chemical weapons work? And then a lot of people also focus on regional areas to understand in depth, you know, East Asia, China, Russia, Latin America. And so there's sort of this regional and functional approach to thinking about it. But at the end of the day, you know, for me, national security is part of a bigger strategy discussion, which is what are your goals as a country and how do you achieve them? And so, you know, there's sort of soft power and hard power, hard power being more like military, soft power being more cultural and economic factors. So how do we coordinate those? to protect ourselves and achieve our goals. And so, you know, I'm always thinking about it from the sort of strategy standpoint, and then you get into the nitty gritty from there. It seems like a discipline or an area that you'd study that then changes how you see the world and it's showing up and coloring how you're interpreting news, how you're interpreting events and developments. How has it changed at all the way you think about either what's going on in the world or you think about political news? How does that filter show up in your daily life, if at all? I think you know, my experience both in school and working with the military gives me a lot of pause about the limits of military power for achieving sort of political goals. Turns out that the harder you hammer someone, the, like that doesn't necessarily make them want to change their mind. You know, Hitler thought that by bombing London and Britain that they would, you know, kind of give up. And obviously the opposite happens. They harden and vice versa. So, you know, I think there are major limits to military power. And I also think that a lot of the, it's given me a lot of skepticism about the claims and expertise of politicians, frankly, a lot of the motivations and incentive structures in the government are not well aligned for the country. They're aligned for people to get reelected. And so I think there's a a really important filter to always be applying, which is, you know, what are the incentives that are driving a country, an individual, a politician, a leader to make decisions and never forget that those are also influenced by culture. So, you know, we go into Iraq and, you know, our intelligence agencies thought there were weapons of mass destruction. And part of the reason there is because they weren't in the mindset of the Iraqis that they needed you know, there's a lot of things going on, but one of the reasons is they needed to front that they had some of this stuff or at least leave ambiguity because they have, you know, on their border, the Iranians are an incredibly powerful state on their border. So if you don't get into the mindset of your partner or your adversary, you're going to make the wrong decisions over and over. So there's a concept called mirror imaging, which is assuming the other person thinks like you do. And that is one of the classic cognitive errors that I see repeated over and over.